Hello, I'm Martin van der Weer, and I'm a town councillor for Helmsley, a small market town in North Yorkshire. And I'm going to tell you the story of Helmsley's connection to the Magna Carta. This year, 2015, is the 800th anniversary of the achievement of the Magna Carta at Runnymede, when King John agreed to grant rights to the free men of England that have come down through the centuries and formed the basis of the rule of law, not only in England, but actually throughout the English-speaking world. So, what is Magna Carta and what is Helmsley's connection to it. Well, actually, Magna Carta is a drab-looking object. It's a piece of parchment about the size of an A3 sheet of paper. Um, we have a facsimile copy of it in Helmsley that will be exhibited in Helmsley Castle this summer. But as an object, it's not the most exciting thing you've ever seen. It's something where you have to use some imagination to understand its historical importance and the resonance that it's gathered over these eight centuries. It was actually repudiated within nine weeks of that event at Runnymede on the 15th of June, 1215. It was then revived, it was kicked around, it was ignored for long periods of history and then adopted in the United States when they wrote their constitution, became revered over there and so on. So it's had a kind of turbulent history. Only three or four of its 63 clauses are still active as part of English law, yet it's an artifact of world importance, carved into history, a kind of totem of the liberties of free men and women. So that's the Magna Carta, but what's Helmsley's connection? Well, I'm going to talk about a medieval baron called Robert de Roos, spelt R-O-S but pronounced as though it was R-O-O-S, Roos. He was the baron of Helmsley at the time, and let me tell you about him. So we'll start with his great-grandfather, who was called Peter, or Piers de Roos. He was the steward of Holderness, which is, of course, an area of East Yorkshire towards the East Coast. He was the steward on behalf of the Lord of Holderness, who was William the Conqueror's nephew, so a big, big man of the Norman aristocracy. And Piers de Roos married a girl called Adelina Lespec. She was the youngest sister of Walter Lespec, who people in and around Helmsley will know the name of because he was the founder of Revo Abbey and he was the kind of great baron of the north of England of the early Norman era. So, Peter and Adelina became the lord, the, the keepers of Helmsley Castle and the estate round about. And Peter had a grandson called Everard. He married another Norman lady called Rose Trusabu from Water in the East Riding. And their son was Robert de Roos, who I'm talking about. So, what do we know about Robert? What do we know of him? What's left of him? There is a tomb effigy of him, which uh, is in the Temple Church in London, and it was described by an 18th century writer as the most elegant of all the tomb figures in the Temple Church, a comely young knight in mail and a flowing mantle with a kind of cowl, his hair neatly curled at the sides, and so on. 
He had a lion at his feet and the whole figure measured six feet two inches. So a tall and handsome knight, we can imagine. We know what his coat of arms looked like. It had three symbols on it which were water bouget or budgets or leather bags. Uh, and there's a kind of medieval pun that the origin of that is in his mother's surname, Trousabu, which could be a way of saying trois bu or trois bouget, three budgets. Anyway, we've got the coat of arms and we know that their first family seat was a little village uh, in Holderness, in East Yorkshire, between Hornsey and Withensea, which is still called Roos today. Uh, and we can see there some remains of a castle at Roos. His mother, being from a Norman family, connected him to estates in Normandy. So there's also a castle uh, in the Calvados region of France called bonneville sur touc uh, which survives as a, as a partial ruin, but looks very like the kind of castles that the Normans were building in England at the time. Anyway, our Robert de Roos had Helmsley as his baronial seat, or caput in medieval English. And he did two great things for Helmsley. The first was that he started rebuilding the castle of Helmsley in stone. Before his time, it was a castle made of earthworks and a kind of timber fortress on a big earthwork base. He rebuilt it in stone. And we can still see some of what he built though it's not the main structures of the castle today. I'll show you a, a plan of the castle. Here it is. North and south. What Robert de Roos built around 1200 is a ring of walls and towers, six towers, a wall about four and a half metres tall with small entrances through it so that his men could actually come out and see off marauders when they attacked, but a pretty formidable stone fortress for the first time. Later in the 13th century, his grandson built some more fortifications, the South Barbican, which is a very fine feature still visible today, and some North fortifications. But if you want to see what Robert de Roos, the Magna Carta Baron, built, it's the lower walls that still exist all the way around, rather rougher looking than the later buildings, all the way around the castle. So he was progressive in the sense that he, he improved the castle considerably, made it a much stronger fortress. But he also did something else very important for Helmsley, which is that he gave Helmsley borough status for the first time. What that meant was that um, Helmsley became uh, a small town in its own right. Previous to that, the people of Helmsley were effectively serfs. They were, they were feudal servants of the Baron of Helmsley. They were in manorial serfdom all their, all their life. But he granted borough status, which means some of the people of Helmsley became what were then called burgesses, Burgers is another word, and they had a certain amount of freedom. They occupied uh, freehold patches of land, and we still have in Helmsley long, narrow back gardens in parts of the town, which are the burgage plots that they were granted. Um, they didn't actually own them outright, but they paid a money rent to the baron instead of uh, doing manorial service as, as serfs. And he also licensed the market for the first time. So the market that still exists every Friday in Helmsley dates back to the era of Robert de Roos and the prosperity of the town, which had been a pretty poor place in earlier days. There were only 30 citizens of Helmsley in the Doomsday Book. Part of the, much of the land around Helmsley was laid waste by the Normans uh, after the Norman conquest and so on. But it began to become a slightly more prosperous place as a result of Robert de Roos's um, 
changes that he brought. So we can think of him as a progressive baron. We don't know whether he was benign or generous to, to the lower social e echelons, as it were, but at least he made progress for Helmsley. There are descriptions of Robert de Roos to be found in accounts of the period. Uh, the great historian of Magna Carta, Sir James Holt, uh, in his book about Magna Carta, published 50 years ago, uh, describes Robert de Roos as a vigorous and persistent decisor, that means a dispossessor of other people's lands, whose men attacked the bailiffs of the Sheriff of York with bows and arrows in 1220, when he was fighting to get his own lands back and put them to flight. He also describes him as a sophisticated and original in his legalistic arguments that he pursued for other of his land claims. So we can picture a clever, tough, energetic, probably pretty ruthless fellow in the way of the Middle Ages, who left his mark on Helmsley in the stone-built castle we still have today and in the foundation of the town as a borough with, with free men of the borough. Um, there were connections between de Roos, his family, and other sites around here, Kirkham Abbey, the other side of Malton, Byland Abbey and Revo Abbey, where in fact Peter de Roos was buried, and so on. And there is an English heritage trail connecting those sites this summer. So that's Robert de Roos, but what was his connection to Magna Carta? Was he a big figure in the story? A walk-on part? Well, let's try and follow that um, aspect of his life. The key fact about him is that he was one of 25 sureties, or guarantors, elected by all the other barons who were rebelling against King John in 1215 to try to ensure that King John stuck by the pledges that he made in Magna Carta. Some of our neighbours also had barons, so there was William de Mowbray from Thirsk and there was Richard de Percy from Topcliffe and so on. There were barons from Skipton, from Pontefract, uh, from Annick and elsewhere. They were scattered across England in no particular pattern. Now, the official history book of Helmsley says de Roos was one of King John's most resolute and unflinching opponents. Uh, I've seen him elsewhere referred to as one of the leading northerners, the group of barons from the north of England, led by a man who he was related to by marriage, Eustace de Vesey of Annick, and so on. One contemporary chronicle says he was one of the chief incentors of this pest, that is, the baronial resistance to the king, by April 1215, when the barons got together at Stamford in Lincolnshire to agree on the demands that became Magna Carta. But actually, that's not quite an accurate picture of de Roos, because right up until the last moment, right up until late April 1215, he really seems to have been quite wobbly, and he certainly wasn't an early leader of the rebellion, but a late comer to it. Now, I'll again, I'll try and explain that. We have to go back into some background about uh, the dynasty to which King John belonged. He was a Plantagenet king. The Plantagenets were French, as the Normans were, but they were actually enemies of the Normans. They were warlords of a neighbouring part of France, Anjou, in the Loire region. Um, an English history of this whole period is an Anglo-French affair, as it were, a, a battle of strength between factions fighting over lands all the way from Hadrian's Wall to the Pyrenees. And the Plantagenets succeeded to the English throne through the fact that Henry II, who became king in 1154, was the son of Matilda, who was a granddaughter of William the Conqueror. So the crown at that point passed from a Norman dynasty to the Plantagenet or Angevin dynasty. But the Plantagenets had a pretty bad reputation that lasts to this day. They were 
very brutal, very extractive, tyrannical rulers. They took treasure and coin wherever they could find it to finance their armies in their battles, particularly in France and in the case of Henry II's successor, Richard the Lionheart, Richard I, to finance crusades in Palestine. Henry II was a brutal king associated with the murder of Thomas a Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury in 1170. And there's a phrase used about him ruling with ira et male volontia in Latin, anger and malevolence in the way that he ruled. John, King John, was Henry II's youngest son. He succeeded Richard in 1199. He plotted against Richard when Richard was alive. He dispatched a rival claimant who was his nephew, Arthur. Uh, he possibly beat Arthur's brains out on a rock himself, personally. And he proceeded to rule in just as tyrannical and extractive a way as his father had done before him. In particular, he took, he took treasure, silver coin, whatever he could take from the barons and the earls, the people who actually had the wealth. There was no point trying to tax the, the peasants and the serfs. They had no wealth. So the taxing was done on the barons and he taxed them on inheritance. When they inherited their estates, he would charge them a tax. When they married, he'd charge them another tax. If they didn't want to do military service, he charged them again. If they went to the, the kind of primitive form of justice, the court system that dated from Edward the Confessor to settle land disputes, again, that was another cash cow for the royal treasury and so on. At the same time, he had a reputation as a lustful king who, who uh, had his way whenever he wished to with the wives and daughters of the barons. And so he was pretty deeply un unpopular. Modern historians have said, well, he wasn't all bad uh, in the sense that he, he did actually govern pretty effectively. He applied justice with some vigor, even though he extracted money from the system. And the country was certainly a more orderly place than it had been under his, uh, some of his predecessors. Um, but he governed largely in his own interests and I think we can agree with historians that he was a pretty bad king. Here's one Victorian account of him uh, by the Bishop of Oxford, William Stubbs, Victorian writer. He was the very worst of all our kings, a man whom no oaths could bind, no pressure of conscience, no consideration of policy restrained from evil a faithless son, a treacherous brother, an ungrateful master, to his people a hated tyrant. In the whole view, there is no rede redeeming trait. One chronicler of the time, called Matthew Paris of St Albans, wrote that England reeks with John's filthy deeds. Hell itself is befouled by John. So there you are, nothing much to be said in John's defence. By the decade of Magna Carta, 1210 onwards, he'd been excommunicated by the Pope, um, falling out over the appointment of bishops. Some of the barons of England were beginning to plot against him. He relied for holding power on, basically on French mercenaries, on, on barons and knights who'd come over from uh, the Loire region with him, who were pretty brutal, who were hated by the Anglo-Norman establishment. He was losing ground against his enemies in France, uh, and his, his coffers were often nearly empty. For that reason, he resubmitted himself to papal authority in 1213 in order to try and get the Pope to support his campaigns in France. But by 1215, the year of Magna Carta, Many of the English barons were resolutely against him, and so were, importantly, the merchants of the city of London who were sick of being overtaxed by him. So, let's try and fit Robert de Roos into that, that narrative. Robert had succeeded to his father's lands, including the Helmsley estates, in 1191. 
he naturally paid a big tax called a relief to the king, to the King Richard at that time, of a thousand mark. A, a mark was 13 shillings and four, so a thousand marks is about 650 pounds, which in those days was a small fortune. Um, he got into trouble, Robert de Roos, in um, 1196. He was in Normandy uh, with Richard I, and he was asked to take charge of a prisoner, an important prisoner, uh, captured by King Richard, called Hugh de Chaumont, and he held him in his castle at Bonneville in France. But Robert de Rousse's servant, who was the keeper of the castle, was bribed into letting this man de Chaumont escape. Um, the servant was hanged, and Richard imposed another huge fine on Robert de Rousse, this time 1,200 marks, so that's so far 2,200 marks he's been fined, and he takes years and years to pay off his debt. And what I think you see happening over the next few years is that he's permanently in hock, first to Richard, then to John, and he's somewhat loyal, but always in a rather sort of tense relationship. Robert de Roos married a Scottish princess, in effect, a daughter of William the Lion, King of Scotland. And uh, in the early years of John's reign, John used him as a kind of diplomat to go and visit his father-in-law, William the Lion, and set up meetings between the two kings and so on. Uh, Robert was obviously quite well in favour for a while. He was given more land. He was given all the lands that Walter Lespec um, had held in the north of England in Northumberland, including Wack in Northumberland, where he built another castle. Uh, he served in Normandy, for John, he did various other services for John and so on. But there are other parts of the story where he's clearly in John's bad books. Uh, at one stage, Robert's son is held hostage by the king, uh, probably in an attempt to make him pay over more money. Anyway, largely, Robert stays in favour with the king right up until 1212, 12, 12, um, He's appointed Sheriff of Cumberland, an important job in the north of England. Um, he's given more lands and manorial rights. He's given a license to sail a ship uh, across the seas laden with wool and bring back wine in exchange and so on. He was a witness to John's surrender of the kingdom to the Pope in 1213. And right up until the, actually the beginning of April in 1215, He's receiving more favours from the king that suggests uh, he's still on the king's side. The king even intervened with the Bishop of Winchester to make sure that an aunt of Robert de Roos became the abbess of Barking in Essex, uh, for which the other candidate was a sister of one of the, by then already declared, baronial leaders, a man called Robert Fitzwalter from Essex. So... Maybe the king was trying to keep buying Robert de Roos's support. Maybe Robert was truly loyal to the king. But suddenly, in April 1215, he effectively changes sides. He joins up with the rebel barons at Stamford. He helps draft the Charter of the Barons, a separate document which still exists, which was in the, essentially their wish list, what they wanted in the Magna Carta. And he went to Runnymede, and at Runnymede he was one of the 25 barons elected as sureties to compel the observance of the Great Charter that was agreed on that day. So, an interesting point of history is, did the king sign the charter? No, he certainly didn't. He probably couldn't write. The only people who could write in that age... Were, were monks and clerks uh, whose job it was to do that. Did he seal the charter at Runnymede? Probably not again, though there are many images of him doing just that and also with a quill pen in his hand, but they're probably wrong. What he almost certainly did was swear an oath and the barons swore an oath and the oath was witnessed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop Langton, who was there, and then the king's 
uh, writing office, his chancellery, produced something like 40 copies of Magna Carta, sealed them with the royal seal, uh, and sent them around the country so that the people of England knew that this had happened because, of course, there was no other means of broadcasting it. What was the Magna Carta? Well, it was a peace treaty, though not a very successful one. England was on the verge of civil war at this moment. The barons, the merchants of London against the king and his loyal French uh, subordinates. It was a settlement of certain particular grievances of the time. It names some of those French henchmen and mercenaries who were with John and says they were to be excluded from powerful positions henceforth. It deals with a rather curious thing, fish weirs in the Thames and the Medway. Why? Because fish weirs were impeding the ships that were so important to the trade of the merchants of the City of London. It guaranteed some traditional freedoms of merchants and other cities. It established a standardisation of weights and measures, um, which was a major step forward. Uh, and importantly, it um, granted freedom to the Church of England. Uh, and that was the important point inserted by Archbishop Langton. In some ways, it was conservative rather than progressive. It restated a lot of existing principles of feudal and forest law. It followed a tradition of charters in which preceding kings on their accession and at intervals during their reigns would issue charters saying what rights they agreed uh, belonged to the barons and the, the people of England, but they were more often than not breached almost immediately by the kings who, who reigned by divine right, so there was no sanction to stop them if they didn't abide by what they'd said they would abide by. Foreign monarchs did much the same thing. Uh, so it was a lesser, lesser set of pledges than it, than it sounds. And when it talks about free men, it doesn't mean that all the men and women of England, uh, in fact, least of all the women of England, but uh, not all the men were free by any means. Many were still in feudal serfdom, but some were free. And it did give them rights and liberties particularly to trial by jury and, and a justice system uninterfered with by the king. But what was different about this over all previous charters was the appointment of these 25 sureties, these barons who had the right set down in the charter itself to enforce it on the king and make sure that he did what he said. Well, so that was a beautiful idea and a step forward in, in constitutional uh, law, but it made no difference at all to John, who secured an absolution from his oath from the Pope nine weeks later uh, and repudiated it. And so civil war then ensued again. Robert resisted the royal fight back. He fought with the other northern barons. He held out uh, in his castle in Northumberland for quite a long time. Uh, he was excommunicated by the Pope. His lands were given to a loyal earl, an earl who was loyal to King John and so on. After King John died, only a year later, October 1216, Robert was still resisting up until a battle at Lincoln in 1217, where his son was captured. But sometime after that, he basically gave in. Uh, he submitted himself to... Henry III, the boy king who followed John. His lands were restored to him, though he had to fight to get some of them back from the bar other barons they'd been given to, but the king restored them to him, and he was back in favour. As for Magna Carta itself, it was reconfirmed by Henry III uh, three times, definitively in 1225, and Robert was there as a witness to, to see that reconfirmation in Westminster by Henry III. And the 1225 version is held in as much reverence in legal terms uh, today as the original 1215 version because it contained a new clause which made it apply in perpetuity. Um, that if anything contrary to this charter is procured from anyone, it shall avail nothing and be held for naught. So, what happened to Robert? He was now 
probably in his late 40s. He went into a monastery, he took the monastic habit as a Templar uh, in the last couple of years of his life. He died in 1226 or early 1227, was buried in the Temple Church in London. And his descendants held the Helm Helmsley Estates until the late 15th century. So, Robert de Roos was one of the great builders of Helmsley, along with Mr. Duncombe, the first of the line that became the earls and barons of Feversham, along with Vicar Gray and other citizens of Helmsley. As for Magna Carta, it survived the centuries. It resonated with generations of English lawmakers, and it was referred back to over and over again in the Bill of Rights in 1689, in the writing of the American Constitution, and so on. The doors of the Supreme Court um, in Washington have a brass relief of King John uh, and one of the barons at Runnymede. At Runnymede itself, the monument there was actually erected by American lawyers, by the American Bar Association. Uh, in 1957 and it has what literally looks like a totem pole, a stone obelisk as it were in the middle of the monument which encapsulates the whole Magna Carta story as freedom under law. So there we are, Helmsley's connection to Magna Carta. Thank you.